<clears throat> Minister, colleagues, I'm delighted to be with you, uh, even though um, my position is that we no longer have reason to be optimistic about humanity's position on this planet. Uh, we do not have time on our side. Now, let me just try and explain why I'm taking that position. I am an optimist. That's the warning I have on my forehead. First of all, if I could have the f next slide. Am I in charge? <laughs> Um, the Paris Agreement, I'm just pulling out three bits of that important agreement, critically important. First of all, the commitment to keep, for global average temperatures to be well below 2 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level, and if at all possible to pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees. I was one of those who took the British government into the position of supporting the 1.5 degrees as the target, and the reason has now emerged from the IPCC report that anything above 1.5 is going to create real risks for the management of humanity's future. The second was accepting nationally determined contributions on emissions, but then recognizing that these, when added up after the meeting, would not be enough to meet the first agreement, we had a review mechanism put in place. The idea of the review mechanism was that every country would then progress towards an improved contribution from the one they had previously given, so that when we add them all up, we can achieve the 1.5 degrees, if at all possible, target. Now, the next slide shows the real point behind the IPCC report. What you see is baseline, that's the emissions on the vertical axis. We have billions of tons of greenhouse gas as the CO2 equivalent emitted each year. And the uh, horizontal scale is 2010 to 2050. So what we see is the baseline is, uh, is pretty bad news. Current policy trajectory is better than that. But if you look at the two, the nationally determined contributions all added together, uh, whether you look at the unconditional or the conditional, the conditional was uh, particularly developing countries saying, if you give us this, we'll do more. Both of them are way out of line with where we would need to be on a two degree centigrade pathway into the future, let alone the 1.5 in, in purple. Now, I'm going to stress that even the 1.5 is not going to be enough to manage our risks going forward in time. And let me tell you, one reason why I'm doing this is on the next slide summarizing a piece of work I led on with the Chinese and Indian governments, in which unusually we brought in risk analysis experts from the insurance and reinsurance industry in the city of London. Now this puts a totally different light on the risks as we move forward compared with the usual IPCC report saying this is the average sea level rise, etc. Now we're looking at extreme weather events with higher sea levels, higher base temperatures, etc., and the risks these put forward to, to mankind. And in particular, what, what emerged, and these came forward from in particular the Chinese government, that they would lose all rice crops in one given year because as temperatures rise, and during the flowering season of the rice crop, if it rises above 32 degrees for three days in a row, that crop produces no rice. So we used that as a marker to see what was the percentage chance of this happening in a given year. And at the moment, it looks comfortable. You might get an insurance agent to insure China against that. But as you move forward in time, even five, 10 years on the, the new trajectories, we find that that approach is a very risky situation for China. And let me say, and for the world, because China has deep pockets. They'll be buying food supplies from other parts of the world, wheat, etc., and all of us will experience a very strong march upwards in rice prices. Let me also just mention, we said, the biggest rice pad paddy field in the world is the Mekong Delta. There, it's not so much temperature rise that is going to cause problems, we pointed out, but it was rising sea levels flooding these enormous rice paddy fields in that delta. 
And if that happens, they would be salinated and that's the end of those rice paddy fields. Now, if those two things happened consecutively, you can see that the risk for humanity becomes very great just from those simple uh, analyses. Now, moving on to the next slide, and here's a, an optimistic slide. In 2015, globally, $367 billion was invested in renewable power. I believe this will rise and should rise to a trillion dollars a year by 2020. Here's the big opportunity for wealth creation. The new energy sector in Britain is now the fastest growing economic sector in our economy, turning over 50 billion pounds a year, and we are employing 500,000 people plus in the clean energy sector. Now, all of this is good for economies as we leave the fossil fuel sector as part of our past. However, this hasn't been rising year on year since 2015 in the way that we might have anticipated. And it, uh, it, it is quite apparent that it is stalling for various reasons, one of which is how do we store energy when these renewable energy supplies are intermittent and the sun doesn't shine at night uh, particularly in Iceland. <laughs> and so what, what, what do we do about storing energy and then all the other technologies? How do we replace our steel manufacturing, cement, everything else? So a group of us, and I led this from about six years ago, began working, next slide, on something that came to be called mission innovation. And at first there was a lot of resistance until President Obama said, yes, we'll do it. And then we had 22 nations agreeing to collaborate on public investment in new clean energy technologies emerging from research and development in order to de-risk for the private sector the new technologies to take into the marketplace. So let me stress, it's not the public sector that is going to take these into the marketplace. There's the 22 heads of government together with a chap called Bill Gates standing there next to uh, the President of the United States, as he was then. Um, and Bill Gates had said, OK, I'll put up a billion dollars. And he got together with uh, 28 uh, other billionaires. And together, they formed a breakthrough energy coalition. And they were to take these technologies themselves into the marketplace. So here was the, the boost that we needed. Now, that is, that is up and running. We've had uh, three ministerial meetings. The next one will be in Canada, and the technologies are beginning to emerge. The next slide shows my favorite. This is a British company building this um, airship uh, on a previously disused airfield north of Paris. This was at the invitation of the uh, French president. And this airship, let me tell you, it's enormous. It's an aluminum frame, but... Under that airship, you see a freight carrier, and uh, you also see an enormous vehicle that looks pretty small. The total airship is about 12 stories high, 200 meters long, 65 meters wide, and it can take 20 ship's containers fully loaded. The airship is subdivided into 12 sections. I'm excited by this, so let me tell you about it. <laughs> 12 sections like any ship since the Titanic, so that each section separately has an airbag, a helium cylinder, and a pump uh, to store the helium back into the helium cylinder once you wanted to bring the airship back down to ground. Now, it also has a crane. Now, this is an airship that could pick up tomatoes from uh, the tomato fields of Spain, where the, uh, the crates had been left on the ground. They just lifted up into the uh, airship from the air and then brought over to England where we need Spanish tomatoes and delivered from the air to the headquarters of the various industries that sell tomatoes to the public. It, these things don't have to land at an airport except for maintenance. Now, there's a breakthrough technology you look at the Arctic region and how this could be used. It's going to emerge into the marketplace very soon. I've already got an order from the president of Rwanda for four of these. It's going to be like the mobile phone technology was in Africa. Suddenly we have unimpeded ability to move freight around uh, the whole continent. So it is exciting that we're getting these new technologies driven through by thinking 
about how we manage with our fossil fuels. By the way, how does it fly from Spain to Britain without using any fuel? It's, of course, covered with solar panels. Those are electric engines, and it can travel fully loaded at 340 kilometers an hour, and when it's unloaded at about 400 kilometers an hour. It's not sluggish. It's traveling up at 35,000 feet. Next slide. And now I come back to my, my concern. Climate repair. We need deep and rapid emissions reduction. And that's really what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is stressing. But they are also saying we're not going to manage that 1.5 degree target because we would need to get to globally net zero emissions by 2045 to 2055 to achieve that objective. So what we need is to create new carbon dioxide sinks and we need a major venture into this process, including direct air capture. We need all of these technologies and what do we need to drive them through? Of course, I'm going to go back to Kyoto and say we need a carbon price. Uh, and if we have a carbon price that is initially $50 a barrel, and, and sorry, a ton, and then announce that it will rise to 100 and then 150 if we don't get enough uh, transition uh, rapidly enough. And then finally, I've put down it below, refreeze the poles. Uh, and uh, Ségolène Royal has referred to the loss of ice in the Arctic region. I'm actually saying we cannot afford to lose that ice. So let me take my next slide. And in this slide, I'm showing in the center what, what has happened to the, uh, the wind, the, oh, sorry, no, no, I've, I've jumped ahead to my following slide. <laughs> my very good friend, Peter Wadhams at the University of Cambridge has been painstakingly measuring the thickness of the ice in the Arctic region. How he did that was by getting permission to travel on nuclear submarines under the Arctic. He got permission to travel on Russian, American, and British nuclear submarines, and he, uh, to use his devices to measure the thickness. This is much more important, of course, than simply measuring the area covered by a satellite. And what you see is that there's a positive feedback. The, the, the thickness is on the vertical scale and time from 1975 uh, through to 2015. His last measurement was actually 2012. That's when he retired. Um, what, what you see there, the positive feedback, as the Arctic Sea becomes exposed, of course it absorbs sunlight at 85% plus, whereas the ice is reflecting about 80% of the sunlight, and so the Arctic Sea warms up more rapidly, and so the ice melts more sharply. Now, I have to quickly say this is the yearly minimum Arctic ice volume data, so there's no misunderstanding. Of course, in the winter, it thickens up, but it's always thinner and thinner as it moves forward in time. Now, what, what is the real danger of that? The, the first is, is shown in the next slide, where you see the polar vortex, which is this upper atmosphere wind that keeps the cold air in the Arctic, the polar vortex has become, on occasion, very severely distorted. I was speaking in Houston, Texas, to the governor and the senators on climate change, not not all of them believe in climate change as a science, but nevertheless, I was able to show this to them when the temperature in Houston was minus 15 degrees centigrade and the temperature at the Arctic was very close to zero. So the Arctic was much warmer than Houston and I showed the data from our Met office to explain this. There's the polar vortex severely distorted and the coldest region on the planet was at that time between Canada and the United States. So, what, what is the, the problem there? Well, of course, the problem is that that hot spot in the Arctic Sea region is the cause of the disturbance of the polar vortex, and that hot spot is right next to Greenland. And if the Greenland ice starts to melt irreversibly, and the scientific community now believes it will follow the pathway of the uh, Arctic ice itself, in other words, it'll become irreversible due to a positive feedback effect, the ice, when it melts, creates lakes, on the top of the ice, these lakes, when they get darker, deeper, they get darker blue, they absorb more sunlight. So that positive feedback means goodbye to the Arctic, uh, the uh, Greenland ice. And when that goes, of course, globally, the sea, sea level would rise by seven meters. That'll take some time. It's a very large chunk of ice, 
but a global sea level rise of one or two meters is of course already going to be a, a massive challenge. I just think it's worth showing on the next slide. The agreement reached amongst the scientists is shown here in a, a sort of probability curve, which is sea level rise in meters, please note, um, and rising temperature above the uh, pre-industrial level. And what, what of course you see is that 1.5 degrees centigrade is already teasing the point at which we hit that irreversible melting of Greenland ice. The other melting giving rise to two to three meters is the normal rise due to heating of the ocean and melting ice uh, elsewhere on land. The big gray region is the error margin. And of course, if we're lucky, it won't happen until we get to about 2.2 degrees. But I don't think anyone here believes we should travel on the assumption that we are going to be lucky. So I want to just emphasize here that the severe risks we're faced with means that unless we club together, imagine if there was a near-Earth object that we, the astronomers had picked up heading towards the planet and we were told it's going to hit the planet in 12 years' time. I believe we would all get behind the effort to blow this thing away from our path. And that's the sort of situation we're in now. I believe what it means is not only no reason to be optimistic, I, I, I think we really have to move forward on this. What it means is that we all need to recognize that the ecosystems are the very systems that enable us to live on this planet. We need to change our attitude, and I fear that the attitude has been very much driven by the West over the last few hundred years, successfully growing our economy and ignoring what we were doing to the ecosystems. That's a big change. We need to change our way of thinking. And our way of thinking has become embedded in ignoring what we are doing to the atmosphere because we can make money otherwise. Uh, I think I ought to stop at that point. Um, I can carry on and on, as you might imagine. We have never been in this situation before as a civilization. Our civilization is running the p to the point where what we continue to do, what we start doing, and what we plan to do over the next 10 to 12 years will determine the future of humanity for the next 10,000 years. Thank you.